Well, good morning to all of our um, attendees. Thank you very much for signing up to um, this webinar discussing cancellations, uh, crisis management and the coronavirus. It's obviously very unprecedented times um, and uncharted territory really for all of us. Um, and we at the EMA want to do as much as we can for our members and for the, the wider industry at large um, and as such, we have, we're starting to roll out um, a number of online um, discussions, webinars, groups, videos. Um, we started last night with um, our weekly well-being discussion. And then today, um, I guess a really pertinent discussion around um, the coronavirus and, and um, the impact it's having and what the future might look like. Um, I am not going to um, spend too much time talking because I know there's lots to discuss. Um, in terms of getting questions to our panel, you should find um, a Q&A um, section to all of our attendees. You can type in your questions and um, you should also have the opportunity to upvote ones you like and want to hear answered. And at some point, Martin, who is our moderator, will... Um, We'll get through some, some of those questions for us. Um, this record, this session is also being recorded, so um, we will be publishing it um, on our website and sending it out via various social channels afterwards. So um, there is opportunity to catch up if you get cut off or anything like that. Um, so I am going to um, mute myself and hand over to Martin Fullard, who is uh, editor of Conference News and and huge uh, event industry champion he's been doing a great job at championing our industry um since this crisis well for, for a long time but especially since this crisis began so uh thank you marty and, and i'll leave it with you now thank you james and good morning everybody yep i'm the editor of conference news magazine it's certainly been a busy few months for all of us uh, certainly the last month has i don't know has it shot by or has it dragged on too slowly anyway i'm delighted to say i'm joined by an absolutely superb panel this morning and i'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves uh, and I'll, i think we'll go clockwise of how i see them on the screen so richard please introduce yourself to the audience hi richard waddington i am chair of ema um, and joining the panel, giving people some oversight and insight onto what we're hearing from the membership. Um, we've done some, done some market research with people, um, which I encourage everyone to get involved with because it gives us a good um, litmus paper on where things are happening and everything else. But yeah, that's me. And Claire Freeman. Hi, thanks. Uh, my name's Claire Freeman. I'm a lawyer from the law firm Clifford Chance. Um, and across our global network, we've been advising clients on the cancellation or postponement of significant trade, arts and sporting events in light of the outbreak. So I'm here today to talk you through from a legal perspective, what you should be considering when faced with the cancellation or postponement of an event. Thank you, Claire. Karen Caden. Hi, good morning, Karen Caden. I'm the managing partner of Brands at Work. Uh, we're a creative agency specializing in B2B, B2E, and B2C uh, communications. Certainly live was a, a, a definite sweet spot, but right now what we're having conversations with our clients about is how to keep communicating, how to keep engaging um, audiences during a time where uh, social distancing measures are rightfully in place. And Christina Petrova. Hi everyone, I'm Christina. I work for a research and advisory firm called Gartner and I'm one of the conference um, leads uh, for our premium services portfolio um, and I'm also on the EMA board as well. Great. So before we kind of jump into some of the questions that the panel and I have been discussing before we came on air, I think, is that the right terminology to use? I think it is. Uh, I'm just kind of keen to gauge a little bit of a, a temperature test from our panel about where we are at the moment. What is the current situation as they see it with regards to COVID-19 and event cancellations? And Richard, could I ask, maybe we start with you? Yeah, thanks, Marty. Um, basically, everything in the last three weeks has fallen off the shelf. The If we look at the event industry generally, 70 billion dollar sorry 70 billion pound industry market for the uk alone and even you know 10 times that globally i assume um but it has totally dried up everything has been cancelled everything has stopped we've 
you know, we talked to our membership and we did a we did a questionnaire over a week ago now. So we do need to perhaps re redo that, James, and get some more feedback. But immediately we had 60 percent of people of events were being cancelled or postponed. Um, that certainly would have increased. That was being pushed at sort of three months. We saw that start to creep to six months. And we are now hearing comments on our um, member WhatsApp group of stuff being pushed now absolutely to the third quarter. People thinking or seeing that stuff will come back um, in that third quarter, but already started to talk about if it does, how the hell are we going to deliver it? Because that's a big challenge in its own right. Venues are already fully booked. Um, and that is, you know, we all know that October, November are probably the two of the busiest months of the year for events. Um, so, you know, it's, it's chaos. Um, however, in saying that, I think everyone is going through a process at the moment of the panic situation. So, okay, how do I, do, what do I do? How do I do this? How do I manage working from home, looking after my kids, as well as doing my day to day job? How do I keep in contact with my team and communicate? Um, how can I help the company communicate on virtual platforms? And I know we'll come to that. Um, then, so there's a panic mode that we're still probably currently in or on the back, on the tail end of that, moving to what I would call like situation reality. Okay, so this is the new norm for now. How do we now work in that environment and look at that? And then moving to the looking forward. And we're already seeing um, people asking EMA about things we should also be looking at, other areas we should be looking at within our business, how are we getting our house in order, ready to cope um, with what's coming down the pipeline in the future. We're talking more, already talking about sustainable events, talking about um, access events, i.e. for disabled people and things like that. So, you know, people are now starting to talk about the business in the future. Sorry, quick ramble, but yeah. Karen, what about you from the agency perspective? What's your take on where we are? I, I would echo Richard's points. It's um, you know certainly Armageddon when it comes to anything in the in the near future when it comes to cancellations and postponements. I mean the rea the reality is mass gatherings are just not on the table for the foreseeable future. I think the really difficult part is the uncertainty, the the fact that there is no clear exit strategy for COVID, um, and that's probably what's putting an immense amount of pressure on on the industry, <clears throat> agencies, probably corporates alike. But um, when I think we need to kind of closely monitor what's going on in Asia, how they're kind of coming out of things, and, and that might start to restore some confidence. We um, had a, we've been impacted by this very early on. One of our clients in Hong Kong had to cancel an event back in February before this was starting to send shock and all waves across uh, Europe. And, um, and we're now starting to see, a, a, you know, a, a, t a timid restoration of confidence. It's not, not guns blazing, but talking about, late September um, to, to put that event back on. Um, but I think the, the, the reality is that, you know, we're already starting to look to 2021 and talking to clients about that because it's not just the end of the year that's gonna be creating a bit of a, a, an availability car crash with venues. It's, it's already starting to create that in 2021. So be looking ahead now. Christina, what, is, what are your views on where we are from your perspective? From our perspective, we've kind of either postponed or cancelled everything until the end of August at the moment. Um, and the way we've done it is we run hundreds of events globally. So we've just looked at which are which events take priority, which are the most kind of important events that we definitely have to have this year. And we've postponed those. Um, everything else um kind of has been cancelled we are looking to 2021 similarly to what karen mentioned um in 2022 um we kind of normally anyway try to plan our events uh, kind of three years ahead but um it is it is very uncertain so uh, i think we're all learning as we go and um we'll just kind of see how things develop but something that richard mentioned it's a good opportunity for us to kind of start thinking of other areas side projects where we might have not had time to think about before we are focusing on things like that as well um, and we are trying to run some of our events virtually but again gartner is a company where we always push people to go to live events because it's very much about 
our interaction with our members and also peer connections. So it is a new field for us and it's something that we are exploring at the moment as well. So Claire, I'd like to now bring you into the conversation and uh, on the points that we were discussing before we, uh, before we came online. On cancellations and postponements, can you pay, maybe paint, paint us a picture of where we are in the industry right now from, from that perspective? Yeah, so <clears throat> back in February, I'd echo what Karen was saying, actually. Back in February, it was quite interesting in terms of we started seeing the first cancellation or postponement event of events. And at that time, it wasn't quite clear how severe the outbreak was. And that decision was quite a difficult one to make. Uh, whereas now we're in a world where, given the government action around the globe and travel restrictions, all events are, are being cancelled. And people are now looking forward to future events and actually thinking about keeping them under review um, as the position is uncertain, but actually starting to think about entering new wording into contracts to allocate risk allocation uh, between the parties in the event this does continue for longer than we expect and future events do get either postponed or cancelled. So we've really shifted from the world of uncertain whether we should cancel the event or not to now how do we get through this patch of the business and how do we you know, maintain those relationships and hopefully um, hold those events further down the line. So on future kind of contracting and legal obligations, how's kind of COVID-19 really going to impact these future events? I mean, Q3 and Q4 is going to be very packed by the sounds of it. Is it going to ha I mean, can you explain to us how it will dictate actual clauses in contracts? So uh, the way I've seen people deal with it um, so far is that they expressly address COVID-19 or its successes um, in new contracts. So they actually expressly deal with whether fees will be repaid or fee credits provided if an event is subsequently cancelled or postponed due to the outbreak. But it's very much as to what clause you put in the contract is going to be a commercial deal between you and your client or supplier. Um, you know, everybody is in this together and, and having to come up with new solutions. But that is a common um, approach I have seen so far. Now, you mentioned that you uh, earlier on, you had a nine point plan that you wanted yep. to share with our audience. Would you be willing to do that now for us? Yep, no, nope, more than happy to. So really, uh, when faced with the cancellation or postponement event, there are at first two crucial questions you should ask yourself from a legal perspective. The first is, do you have insurance? And the second is, what do your contracts say? In relation to insurance, it's important to identify at the outset which policies may respond to losses. And compliance with policy provisions around notification and management of losses is often a prerequisite to insurance cover. So you need to understand fully what you are required to do under those insurance policies. Turning to the question of what your contracts say, I'm going to talk you through a nine point checklist that should be considered when looking at your contracts. So point one, does the contract contain a force majeure clause? A force majeure clause is normally used to describe a contractual term which one or the bo both of the parties is entitled to suspend performance of its obligations or to claim an extension of time for performance following a specified event or events beyond its own control. Point two, is the epidemic specifically covered by the force majeure clause? So force majeure clause usually contain a list of events which may constitute force majeure. And that list might include epidemic, plague, disease, etc. If epidemic outbreak is one of the examples in the force majeure clause, you should then analyze whether it satisfies other general requirements under the clause. So for example, some clauses may only be invoked if the specified event makes the contract of uh, the performance of the contract impossible, which is quite a high bar. And the burden of proving that force majeure applies is on the party seeking to rely on the clause. Point three. Does the force majeure clause cover other circumstances triggered by the epidemic? For example, the list of force majeure events in the contract may include government order or government interference. 
Therefore, actions taken by the government in response to this outbreak, for example, travel restrictions and lockdowns, may constitute a force majeure event. Point four, is there sufficient causation connecting the force majeure event and non-performance? Establishing causation is fact and clause specific, but the following high level points should be borne in mind when considering causation. Force majeure must be the sole cause of a party's failure to perform. And circumstances making contractual performance more expensive and burdensome, but not impossible, are unlikely to suffice. Point five. What are the obligations of the party claiming force majeure relief? There are typically two obligations. The first is an obligation to notify the other party, and therefore you need to carefully check your contract for the timing and form of any notice provisions. The second is an obligation to mitigate losses. A party claiming force majeure relief is usually under a duty to show it has taken reasonable steps to mitigate losses or avoid the effects of the force majeure event. For example, you should therefore consider whether the event could be postponed, held virtually, reduced in size, or held with further safeguards in place. Subject to what your contract says, failure by the party to satisfy such obligations might result in a party being unable to invoke the clause or being liable for losses caused by its failure. Point six, what are the legal consequences of invoking a force majeure clause? Contracts often provide for one or more of the following consequences. In most contracts, establishing a force majeure event will lead to suspensory relief from performance until the event is over. Commonly, parties bear their own costs arising from any force majeure delay. An extended period of force majeure can lead to a right for one or more parties to terminate the contract. If the parties do not wish this to happen, it is important to engage in discussions sooner rather than closer to the deadline. And it may be preferable for these to be held on a without prejudice basis so the discussions cannot be used by either party in any future legal proceedings. Point seven, does the contract contain any other relevant clauses that may assist? For example, does the contract contain clauses which exclude or limit your liability in certain circumstances? I have seen wording limiting the organizer's liability for all losses, costs and damages directly or indirectly caused by events outside of the organizer's control. And a clause like that may assist where you don't have a force majeure clause. Point eight, are there any other relevant rules under applicable law which may assist? So for example, under English law, the doctrine of frustration could be another form of relief available if your contract does not include a force majeure clause though the threshold for a successful frustration claim is often a high one. Finally, point nine, what other factors should be considered? When considering whether to declare force majeure or to oppose another party raising a similar defense as a result of coronavirus, one should consider not only the contractual agreements and legal principles, but obviously also commercial, reputational and other factors. So how will that decision affect the long-term business relationship? How will the decision affect other stakeholders, such as shareholders, employees, clients, suppliers, and lenders? Could the decision lead to any actions taken by those stakeholders? If multiple similar commercial contracts are involved, will the declaration of a force majeure event under one contract have any impact on claims under another? And will the decision impact the reputation of the company? So, for example, we have seen matters where, although, although the organiser may have strong legal protection under a contract pursuant to a force majeure clause or limitation of liability clause, the organiser is offering gestures of goodwill to clients to try and maintain good relationships and ensure the survival of the business for the benefit of all stakeholders through this crisis. 
And when seeking to reach a commercial resolution with clients or counterparties, again, consider whether to hold such discussions on a without prejudice basis so it cannot be used against either party in any future legal proceedings. And that really is a whistle stop tour through the kind of nine key points you should be considering when looking at your contracts when faced with cancelling or postponing of your own event. That was very interesting. Thank you, Claire. I, uh, I'm going to have to watch that back later and make some notes. If that's, uh, if, if that, would that be available for uh, for publishing? Could we take? Could we? Could we borrow that plan and publish it? Um, yeah. Let me get in touch with you after that, and we can we can agree some writing, something in writing. Very good, Richard. Was there anything in there that uh, jumped out to you as uh, something that you really think event managers should uh, should take note of? Uh, perhaps they should all start a legal uh, law course whilst they've got a bit of time. <laughs> um, it's like everything, then, isn't it? It's the interpretation uh, of those situations and how you're working with your supply chain. Because challenge for our industry is, and you, I loved it. You said it uh, last week on when you're on the BBC, Marty. Was you know it's like a tree with its roots. It stretches down so deep into um, the the fabrication infrastructure of the UK economy. You know, to the florist, the caterers, the butcher, the cheesemaker, um, to the production company, etc. Um, so I think that you know that's a big challenge. Well, uh, one question, Claire. I had an understanding that a so if you're doing a cancellation, a supplier cannot make additional profit through a cancellation. Is that a legal obligation? So let's say you cancel any dinner um, and they've said it was 100% invoice. So well, hang on a minute, you know, you haven't bought some of this stuff, you haven't got the staff for it, you haven't opened the wine. How do you know, should, what's our discussion around mitigation of these costs? So it always will depend on the wording of the contract, but in general, they should mitigate their losses. So yeah, they need to, and they need to prove what their losses are. So if they haven't spent all of the money putting on the event, they can't claim that money they have not spent. They do need to prove their losses. And often contracts distinguish between direct and indirect losses um, and try to exclude losses that are not foreseeable. Okay. And there's a good question on the right here about um, does this only count for the period now that Boris is saying that we're on lockdown or if someone wants to cancel an event in June, I'm going to presume that's okay because is that force majeure covering that uh, even though we're not in June yet? Yeah, again, the devil's in the detail in terms of you need to look at the specific wording of the force majeure clause and assess is performance of that contract or performance of that event impossible, if that is what the contract says. Or does the contract have something like a lower threshold where it says um, performance is impeded or delayed? It really is going to come down to the wording in that specific contract uh, and you need to assess carefully whether you can cancel or postpone that event in June for example okay i think we'll uh, we'll move the conversation now into the world of communication and i'd like to bring karen in uh we're kind of operating in a in a holding pattern at the moment and communication has never been so important and we're all trying to find you know new ways here we are this morning all online with each other how should businesses be approaching communication while working remotely karen is the what more important than the how what are your views on this I mean, first of all, how we lead and how we communicate during a time of crisis matters hugely. So above the what and the how, it's the, you know, why you're communicating, be super thoughtful about that, communicate with emotional intelligence and sensitivity. Um, but I think it's really important to remember that technology at the end of the day is is a vehicle. It's not a strategy. Um, it's it, your, your, your engagement strategy, the, the um, driven by your audience insight is, is about telling a story and then the, the delivery mechanism comes after that, you know, is that in a digital format and, and in what digital format there. Oh, we lost Karen. Um, which by the way, is just really just a streaming mechanism. Can you hear me? Yeah, we've just we, you cut out for just a brief moment, Karen. There, so maybe if you could go back twenty seconds, that would be useful if you can. <laughs> um, I, I'm not quite sure where I was, but um, I, I, I simply the the point being that technology itself 
is not a strategy. Um, technology is a vehicle for delivering communications. It is not a strategy. It is a means, a delivery mechanism. Where you have to really focus your energies right now is on your engagement strategy, on the story, the narrative that you want to go out there with. And it's more important than ever that we develop those stories, um, script the stories with emotional intelligence and audience insight. Um, I, I can I can tell you, you will be spoiled for choice in terms of the various platforms out there for technology. There's everything from Zoom, which is really just a streaming mechanism, and it's only as good as its content. Um, and and then you know through to a much more um, extreme virtual world. You've probably seen Second Life or Sims or some of those things. There are virtual worlds where you can recreate lifelike environments. So, let's say you were going to have your event at the Cotswolds Water Park, you could take um, you know photos of that environment and reimagine that in a virtual world and create lifelike avatars that look and feel like that. But again, um, you have to consider the design of that experience. It's not as simple as just plugging and playing what would have been your live event format into a virtual world. It's, it's a very different reality. Well, that's, that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, what, we were what we were speaking about yesterday before we, uh, before we came online was you can't just take a live event concept and flip it online, can you? It does, you know, you have to start from the bottom up. Completely, it's, it's you know, we are in unprecedented times. We have to kind of rip up the rule book, um, challenge convention here a little bit and, and, um, and don't rush to the solution and the provider for technology. Take a step back and map out your engagement strategy um, and, and don't assume that you know everything you know about your audience because their worlds have changed immeasurably um, over the past few weeks. So think about it this way. Um, what might have been a conference that you were going to deliver that was a three-day event with back-to-back -back sessions, networking, et cetera, that in a virtual world is going to look very different now because the realities are there are people that were delegates at that conference that are homeschooling now um, <laughs> that, that have uh, meals to cut on that might not have childcare or help at home. They might be single parents. There's a huge range of considerations or they might be consumed with worry about a loved one who's taken ill or be the ill themselves. There's so many things to think about. And so, um, so I think you have to realize that you have to rip up the rule book and it's, it is not as simple as plug in playing what would have been your live event agenda into the virtual world. Um, some, some things, some of the things we're talking to our clients about are around um, making their content rich, engaging and entertaining. So almost like Netflix worthy, cause that's our new, that's our new indulgence right now that we can't leave our houses. Um, making it watchable, learn from social media. Um, you know, interactivity and engagement, because if it's all one way, if it's all didactic, it's dull and you're not creating an experience. Um, I think short and snappy and, and um, bite-sized content is really important right now and, and giving people the opportunity to, to kind of engage on demand. So, so, for example, one of the massive learning events that we were putting on in June for one of our, our, our clients we're kind of reimagining that. And you, you, we were sort of inspired by some of the home learning portals out there that, that are you know, uh, uh, enabling people to sort of watch a webinar either live or on demand and then download a toolkit of assets to engage with on their own time. But again, you know, there are all sorts of tools you can plug into the likes of Zoom, et cetera, that allow for interactivity, um, workshops where you can have people around a virtual table brainstorming things. There's many, many, many ways that you can create that engagement. But again, be super conscious that digital behavior is completely different to live event behavior. And it's, it's, you really need to have some expertise um, in, in designing communications that kind of are empathetic to that reality. I mean, this is a, perhaps a bit off script, but it's just kind of come into my mind now. But do you think that there's a, there might, this is a question for all of you, I suppose, a, a fear perhaps that if these live events that were all being, for, sorry, these virtual events were all being forced to have now prove to be so success, successful that that could actually damage live events going forward. I, I, mean, I think we're going to be busting out of the gates to have some face-to-face -face interaction <laughs> yeah, at the end of this. I'm going to hug a neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Artie, one of the things that we have been discussing already with EMA is how the market returns. Um, it's very, very early days, um, but we're kind of, I'm sort of saying, you know, I see it returning very locally to start with. So the first meetings we're going to be having are 
probably predominantly internal meetings, internal gatherings, whether they're in our offices, town hall sort of stuff. Um, but then very UK focused and perhaps regionally UK, you know, the big international global conference is not going to happen overnight. Uh, it's going to take some time. But I think, we're, you know, we will see the value and the importance of face to face. We'll see, a, you know, a, a more merged style with the opportunity to join live conferences through online media and that being more acceptable now. A lot of people have not done that in the past because they wanted to make sure the audience came to the event. I've always been a, um, a big spokesperson saying that's wrong, that you know you should be integrating this because sometimes I can't go to that two-day conference, but I'd love to see that session. So I think we'll see far, far more greater integration of technology. And the view, there's any positives that come out of this is that we are, as events people, we are going to be more knowledgeable and aware of the technology that's out there and how we can integrate it um, into our events. I think, Christina, I'd like to come to you with this one and interested in the other panellists' views as well. But obviously, we're, I think Richard's made a fair point, which is, you know, we, we, we will probably come back incrementally and perhaps slowly rather than with one big bang. But there's certainly talk at the moment that it's going to be a very busy Q3 and Q4. Christina, do you think that the events industry supply chain could potentially cope with that level of demand, particularly as a lot of them are now mothballed or furloughed uh, and not working? Yeah, it's a tricky question, but I think in terms of um, our events, we will still kind of carry on with the events that we had scheduled for Q3 and Q4, and it's only a few that we have postponed to that period, obviously, with that, you know, thought in mind that it can be quite, it is quite difficult to find space. Um, we are co-locating most of our events where possible. So this is some of the solutions that you kind of have to talk through with venues, what other options you have. Perhaps we will be looking at um, holding events on, you know, days of the week that we wouldn't normally do, but um, because it is still important to obviously have that content out there. It's still important to connect with our clients um, and members. And, you know, on the point that Richard made that, we, you know, there will still be an opportunity for people to join live. I think that we have a great opportunity now to kind of um, really to evolve that experience because you can only, you know, it's one thing to deliver content, but taking away the whole experience of going to an event, I think that is what the um, kind of um, virtual events are missing at the moment. And there's so much that can be done around it. So we do have some time now to focus on that and think about how we can do both have a live event, but also, perhaps have a have a virtual event alongside that for those who are just interested in content and not necessarily in uh, kind of peer networking so much. Maybe that's not their priority right now. Um, but yes, it, it will be difficult. But um, yeah, I don't have an answer, to be honest. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. <laughs> uh, Karen, if I could maybe throw, throw that to you then, the, the, the supply chain, do you think it will be able to, to handle the demand and maybe you know, for your well-placed from the agency perspective to, to know how is the role of the agency going to perhaps change when we come back? Hmm, that's a good question. I mean, I don't have a crystal ball and I think a lot of this depends on how long this lasts because even the most robust agency that has cash reserves at some point is going to run out of money here. And if it's cancellation after cancellation, um, I think our, I, I do think our ecosystem is going to be negatively impacted. I do believe that already um, you are seeing businesses take very drastic measures out of necessity because even with the, the government interventions, it's simply not enough. Um, and, and, the fact that, you know, at first this was, you know, is this just going to be three months? We can probably just about make it, if, if it now starts to become six months and nine months. And then on top of that, the economic impact. So let's forget just the safety issue for a moment. The, econ the long lasting economic reverberations of this are just going to be huge. Um, and I think even when people do start putting events on again, I suspect there will be some sensitivity 
around perceptions of extravagance, et cetera. But I, I do think there's going to be some consolidation in our industry. Sadly, I don't think some agencies will be able to weather the storm. And what I would say is to the corporates out there, do your best. This is not charity, but, in, but definitely do your best to look after your relationships and where possible, um, rather than being punitive and kind of looking after your, your, your own self-interest, everybody has to suspend self-interest right now and look after each other. If you still want your agencies around and if they are versatile enough to help you in other ways and plug other gaps, consider you know, not completely suspending that, that direction of, of, of spend to their way because it is vital right now to, to sustain a lifeline to an industry that has been devastated like many, but very devastated overnight and will not necessarily be subject to the same benefits as for example, the hospitality sector will be. So, um, so it's something to consider. If you want your agency partners to still be standing in six, nine, 12 months, and you're assuming they're gonna be able to deliver your event in 2021, don't assume that right now if you're not at least working with them now to figure out a way forward to make sure that they're gonna um, be able to weather this storm. So, you know, like I said, we are pivoting and a step ahead of our clients now in terms of helping them reimagine and reallocate their spend, um, not necessarily just plunking what would have been the live event into the virtual, but also thinking of different ways to engage audiences that aren't necessarily just virtual meetings, but, um, but distributed comms. There's all sorts of ways to keep conversations going. Um, and can meet, can, I, I did share with James and feel free to distribute that um, a white paper we did on 19 ways to communicate during COVID-19. We're trying our best to keep people communicating right now. And a lot of those ideas don't have to cost a thing. Um, so, so just think about that, but do, do support where possible your, your partners in, in the, in the ecosystem here. Richard, do you, uh, do you echo those sentiments with regards to agencies and the deeper supply chain and corporates have a responsibility to, to be mindful of that? Um, Yes, absolutely. I think the, you know, the, the, again, the roots go a long, long way into the marketplace and so many people are affected and, um, you know, you will, we will see a lot of selfish behavior um, throughout because it's all about independent individual desire um, or sort of desire to survive. I think the, the supply chain you know, if they've managed their businesses right, hopefully it's like all of us, if, you know, if we've all saved a bit of money for a rainy day, um, you know, we will get through this and survive through it. However, if you spent every dime you get and you've got credit card debts and this, that, and the other, isn't it? you know, you're going to find it very difficult. Um, but that, that comes down to sort of common sense and business management. Um, certainly we've had chat on the EMA uh, forum about, you know, I, we've had to cancel, for example, I'll, throw, I'll create a random comment, but we've, um, we've had to cancel, we've canceled an event of £40,000. We're looking, we've mitigated it down to 30 or, you know, 10,000 cancellation costs. Should I be asking my supplier, I age, and it was an agency, for the 30,000 back? They want to keep hold of it. Should I do that for a future event? Yeah, that's a question you've got to ask yourself as the corporate, um, which is basically going to hinge around, you know, is that agency going to be around to supply that event when you want to use that 30,000 credit? Um, and again, Claire, I don't know how, you know, the business would look at that, whether they want that, you know, no, we want that money back in, back in our bank account, not in our supplier's bank account. Yeah, well, it's a good question. I kind of echo everything you've all been saying, which is at the moment, I think everybody's trying to do the right thing. Um, and help each other out and hope that you can almost mothball some of these things for two months, three months. But I agree with you, Richard. I think where it gets difficult is where people are concerned that they're running out of cash or you're concerned your counterparty is running out of cash. And then that question as to how you maintain a good relationship and how you agree a commercial resolution becomes much more tricky. Um, hopefully we're not anywhere near that yet and we're still in a sphere where I think people are trying to do the right thing and keep the whole ecosystem going um, and not, you know, to each other or take more aggressive steps. Um, and, and hopefully that will continue. And it is just trying to find uh, resolutions and ways through a, a difficult period. Very good. 
Okay, guys, we've been talking about 45 minutes, so I now think I'm going to just head to the audience questions. But I think, you know, from, from, from my side, the message that I've been putting out there, and obviously I'm speaking to hundreds of people a day here at the moment, is how you all conduct yourselves now for better or for worse, is how you're all going to be remembered during this crisis. And I think there's a bit of PR management to, to be done there. So I think it's important we are all sensitive to each other's business needs. But we are now going to just have a look at the questions here. So forgive me, I hope my laptop hasn't frozen. Okay, the one that's got the most likes so far... I'm going to have to aim at you, I'm afraid, Claire. Uh, we've got a question here. We have event insurance, but have been told that COVID-19 is not covered under any insurance. Sorry, let me start that again. We have event insurance, but we've been told that COVID-19 is not covered under any insurance policy and no insurance company is considering it force majeure. Any advice in this situation when cancelling an event? Did you get that, Claire? I did get that. Um, I guess the rule of thumb is always notify your insurers of a potential event. Uh, it's a very you know, a potential insurable event. Um, often insurers um, won't confirm cover immediately and will keep the claim under review um, and may ask you for more information. But I guess the rule of thumb is um, do notify if you think you are potentially covered by that policy and do keep your insurers updated and keep in dialogue with them. We do actually have, I have a, a briefing on insurance, which we can send around after this, if that would also be helpful. Great, I'm sure James will be able to uh, coordinate that with you all. Uh, next question, I think I will fire at you, Karen. Uh, when all this is over, soon hopefully, uh, do you think that people will want to go to live events or will they be scared to gather in large groups of say more than 60 or so people? Crystal ball time, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I, again, I, 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 I do think it's going to be sort of a slow return to normal. Um, I don't think it's going to be business as usual for quite a long time. Um, I really think it depends on how this all takes shape over the next coming weeks. Um, and if we sort of closely monitor again what's happening in Asia, is there going to be another huge spike after people are let out of their sort of quarantine measures? I think that will start to restore confidence, not just in the markets and everything else, but also in, in the land of, of, of social gatherings. Um, so so I, I'm hopeful and optimistic by the end of this year that we're going to be in a place where people are in wanting to get back together. And also, if, if this, some of the, the theories around herd immunity or vaccination, if the, all of that comes to, into play or, or even better yet, treatment sooner rather than later, um, all the home testing kits, there's all sorts of things that we could be looking at that, that start to inspire a bit more confidence that things will be back back to some some semblance of normal by the end of the year but i don't think it's going to be overnight i don't think I we're think, going to be having mass gatherings of thousands and thousands of people by by the summer if i'm if i'm wearing my cynical and honest hat right now that could be bad news for the exhibition side of our industry and it's an interesting point you make as well because obviously we've all heard that xl london is to become a 4000 bed hospital <laughs> and uh, my personal view on that I'll happily throw my, throw my hat in there is I think that's a wonderful thing that the events industry is able to join the national effort to, to fight this that's my personal view on it however I was in the ICA live event yesterday and someone was making the comment that they think that they'll an association will never get their delegates to go to XL again because it will be forever tarnished as a place of disease and I, ca I can't quite get my head around that mindset. Richard, you're shaking your head. I mean, what's your views? No, I don't, I don't agree with that at all. Um, you know, it's a venue, it's a space. Mm. That's what it's there for. Um, no one's going to remember it of the, you know, let's say hypothetically the 2000 people that died there. Um, that's life. And no, I think, I think we'll, yeah, we'll embrace that and we'll move on from that quite quickly. If anything, I think they're, I think it's an incredible thing they're doing. And I, I, I would be very, very encouraged to give them all my support in the future for stepping up and making a difference in the world right now. Well, that's something I'll be working on over the next month anyway, which is hearing all the feel good stories about how the events industry is giving back. But we'll move, we'll, we'll carry on with the audience questions here. Uh, I'm not sure, Christina, I'm going to throw you a curveball 
whether you got the answer to this or not, I don't know. Uh, we have moved to webinars. We've been recommended Zoom, but I've also heard that it has connectivity issues. I think we've been okay today. Does anyone have any experience of another good platform that could host over 600 clients for a webinar? Christina, any ideas? Wow. Um, we are using um, WebEx, uh, interestingly, for an event, which is for about 400. Um, but having said this, I don't think we're yet at the expert level uh, in kind of coping with that. So we're, it's very much we're kind of trialing how that will go. Um, and I am curious to see how, you know, it will be only for kind of content sharing really. So I'm kind of interested to see how the conversations will flow. Um, I think Zoom is pretty good. I don't know if it has that, if it's that good for that capacity, but um, these are the two platforms that we've been using so far. I'm not aware of any better kind of platforms. My, my understanding, Marty, is that uh, most of technology can handle the sorts of numbers that, you, that they're talking about there. Um, what people have to understand is it, it comes down to bandwidth and pipe. So when technology talks about pipe is, you know, the size of the cable that is taking the initial feed is only as good as the weakest joint. So, you know, you're going to get breakups. You're going to get things like this is like, you know, even like on here, we lost Karen. Uh, or, yeah, Karen or Claire, I think for, for a few seconds, Karen. Um, and that was because of her her um, Wi-Fi at home or in her local area and you know that's the that's the key challenge to that you can put it out there the systems can take it um, there is we know that there is bandwidth problems in certain areas of the country and stuff like that with you know BT Virgin you know the, they are going to struggle at times um, and the whole system is going into overload you know that you get that trying to use your mobile phone at a football stadium with the 60,000 people in there so, yeah. Richard, another question currently top of the pile. I'm going to aim at you, if you don't mind. How much do you think decision paralysis will affect the industry in the next six months? Ooh, um, depends on who the, who, what the decisions are and being made. I, 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 again, predicting a slow return to any level of normality. Uh, I think big brands will be conscious and aware of um, there is, you know, risk risk management, risk mitigation ongoing going around about, you know, do we put an event? Do we want to do, do we want to be seen to be doing this? Is it going to be perceived correctly? We do not want people to get ill at, at our events, and that gives negative um, connotations. Um, so, you know, that's I think all those things will take into account for the market to be slower to come back than how it went um yeah if that if that kind of answers that question yeah uh okay i think this is a, another question here from anonymous i think claire you'll be the uh, the best person to answer this one it reads we have engaged with a venue that has taken the verbal confirmation of wanting to go ahead as contractually binding despite not actually signing anything. We're being held to this. Can you confirm whether this is allowed? We were not made aware at the time that this was the case. Are you able to decipher that or do you want me to read it again? So uh, my read of that is there's no, they're saying there's no written contract in place and that's, the that's venue the is arguing there's a verbal contract. That's correct, yes. So you can have con verbal contracts, um, but they can be very difficult to prove. So I guess my advice would be to just double check there is nothing in writing in terms of even if it's by email or any recorded telephone calls, which could establish the terms of the contract. But in general, a verbal contract is much harder to prove um, than a written one. Uh, but, you know, I think the cautious approach would be to just double check um, who's been negotiating with that counterparty and whether there is anything in writing to establish what they're saying before taking steps to refuse to pay, for example. Okay. Even, so we, let me add to that. So, Claire, if, for example, I said, oh, yeah, we, we want to confirm that event um, on the 25th of July, can you please send us your contract? Have I confirmed that event? Or I haven't confirmed it until I've signed the contract. 
No, I think that wording, just requesting the contract and asking for confirmation, you need to show intention to create legal, com uh, legal relations. You need some certainty around the terms. You could see an instance where if your email came across like an offer yeah. um, and the other side then accepted it, that could bind you. But I think the example you gave, Richard, I agree with you. I, I don't think that would do it yeah. at all. So even so, if there's an email or a communication, it's like, okay, we wish to proceed. That's not a contract, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, Claire, there's another one aimed for you here specifically, and it reads, you may have covered this, but I'm going to ask anyway in case anyone missed it. Uh, Claire, if your insurance does not cover communicable disease, should you still yep. notify your insurer if your event is cancelled? I guess the question there is double checking. There's nothing else in your insurance policy which may cover you. So even if it's not um, disease is there anything else about government interference or government orders that could um, cover your loss so just double check the wording of your contract from top to bottom to see if there's any uh, basis on making a claim uh, I think earlier on someone was also asking or saying that their insurance didn't cover disease and I think I've seen another contract because of SARS um, uh, when was that eight years ago or so um, a lot of insurers excluded disease such as SARS from events insurance. So that may be why um, some people are finding their insurance isn't covering this. But I think the, the best advice is read that contract from beginning to end that policy to check if there are any other circumstances which may allow you to make a claim. And, and a good one, I think, is government actions and government interference, which we're seeing now. What, can I jump in there? What are the things that we might old agency hat on um, that we I kind of noted going back to the 2007-8 crash and SARS as well is people that were signing the contracts were they authorized within their organization to sign those contracts and um, cables I, I think it's quite often you know event managers or event directors thought, oh yeah I'll sign that are you you know should those really be elevated Presumably, Claire, that's where you have a specialism is it has to come to your table or your desk before you sign, before it's signed. It's not the event management people. I think that there's within our industry, I think there's probably potentially a big learning there going on. Great. OK, I've got another question here from Rosie Gamble. <coughs> and it is, what is the advice given for contracts cancelled before signing when they have been through negotiations and cancelled just before signing legally we are not obliged but from a relationship point of view vendors are suggesting penalties yeah that's a tricky one um in terms of we're seeing this a lot which is you absolutely need to understand your legal position so you look at your contract you have a good um case for arguing you have no loss you don't have to pay anything or the other side doesn't have to pay a penalty but then setting that aside, you don't do, then need to look at the bigger picture, which is, you know, how important is that relationship? You know, are you doing the right thing? Um, and by that, that's a complex question in terms of you have to look at the wider business, all the stakeholders, your employees. Um, and I think those are difficult decisions to make. Uh, but I think, you, you know, you have to look at your own business um, and understand whether that is the right decision to make in the best interests of your business. And, and I guess maintaining that relationship, that may be the answer, which is actually that is such an important client to the sustainability of your business and your events going forward, that it is the right decision. Um, but you, you need to weigh all of that up uh, and balance the various competing demands and, and come out into a position of, is this going to ultimately um, ensure the survival of our business? Uh, is that a reason to do it? Okay, uh, Christina, I'm gonna aim this one at you. Uh, Someone here, Anonymous, says they're definitely facing an internal PR issue. Why do business think the events team are now just sitting at home with their feet up? How are you galvanising your team and how, how should corporates and those working in the event sphere be spending their days while we're all at home? Oh, I mean, the way we are spending our days is really um, just dealing with our cancellations and all of the, we're speaking with procurement um, and our legal uh, team on how we're kind of 
dealing with cancellations and managing the relationships. So um, the way we deal with the situation is legal only gets kind of involved if the situation gets very tricky, if there is a dispute, but if there isn't, it's really all on us. So at the moment, we're focusing our efforts very much on maintaining the relationship with our suppliers. Um, so that takes, um, you know, a lot of our time. Um, and we're also looking at other ways that we can deliver events, uh, potentially virtual. Um, and we work with our program teams uh, on this. So exploring various platforms that can deliver something a little bit more engaging than just sharing content, but um, focusing on the kind of peer engagement, uh, the engagement piece. So yeah, it's not, not exactly that. We're with, uh, you know, our feet on the, on the table and kind of chilling on the lounge. <laughs> furniture i assure you're all very busy uh karen this one uh, i'm going to going to aim at you uh what advice would you give for moving a full day's worth of content to a virtual platform the concern is maintaining audience engagement balanced with live networking between sponsors and attendees yeah, that's, again, a tough one. Right now, um, it's about knowing your audience. Who is attending that event and where are they at now? Has, have their circumstances changed? Um, are they available to attend a full day event or are they um, um, doing, you know, dealing with homeschooling or anything else, their jobs? Um, so one, one thought might be first to actually engage with your audience and, and take a temperature check of how would you like to be engaged with? Would you still like this to be done as a one day event? Um, or would you like us to package this up into bite-sized modules spread out over a course of a week, for example? Um, now that you no longer have, you know, venue costs or anything else, the technology is, the, the cost of delivering via technology is, is tiny compared to um, doing it with co catering hosts and all sorts of things that, that come with, it, with a venue. So again, using that example of, um, of a technical learning event, you know, what would have been um, days and days of content on end are now going to be put into more bite-sized modules and experiences where there's shorter, briefer live sessions. And then if you want to do the homework or networking or any of those things, you can do it kind of at your own pace. Um, so so it, I do think it, it is a good idea to sort of reimagine the agenda that you would have had. But there is no reason why, if, if, you, if your audience has the appetite to engage for a full day and, that, and they have the ability to do that, why you can't use a platform like, like I said, um, VFair is an example of a technology. If you look at that, that's a virtual world technology. You could put things into a virtual world. There, there are other examples of that. And you reimagine that event. So if you were going to have um, TED Talks on stage, you can have the same stage you would have had at you know, whatever venue it was going to be plunked into that world. And then you're streaming content live from TED speakers. You can still have audience engagement and interactivity. So again, I think it depends on what the event was about. If it was around networking, masterclasses, actionable learnings, or entertainment, there's all sorts of ways that you can still deliver that in, in a seamless way in a one day event. Or if it, for example, was more of a um, a conference where people need to engage with content, reflect, go into workshops, it might make sense to split that up over the course of time and allow people to demand that, to, to engage with that more on demand. I think, okay. I think, Marty, that's going to be the big learning here is, you know, like I think Karen said it right at the beginning in, you know, you just can't take a live event and drop it into a virtual world. Um, you know, is, is it more, what's going to work best? Is it these drop-in sessions that you can come and watch something? You know, you've got, you've got program events, but I can now click in and click out over three days and watch these things live, or that I can see the recording of them. Um, do I want to network virtually with the audience? Hopin uh, is a great platform that allows you to network so that you can have a session and then, okay, it's coffee break, guys. And you can see who you want to chat to and you can then have one-to-one -one chats with those people over the system next you know next events coming live in five minutes um, completely i think yeah. the thing the key consideration there though is again at an event the difference is you can get up from your chair you then get to go to a coffee break you get to socialize and get to move with somebody whereas the networking situation in one of these virtual events is you're still sitting on your bum at your computer and i think there's only so much appetite people have for doing that in a day. Um, and, you know, I had a day yesterday where it started at eight and I didn't leave my laptop till 11. That's just too long. And I don't think audiences want to engage to that level. So that's why I was saying shorter, sharper, bite-sized contents and modules, but then absolutely you can create engagement. Um, 
and again, re redeploying maybe some of the spend that would have been allocated towards catering or, you know, sets and stages. Now that the, the, the ability to deliver that in a technical world is, is short, is, is fractional, um, redeploy that to television worthy content, stuff that, you know, you don't mind sitting on your bum and watching Netflix for hours on end, make your content, make your show binge worthy. Um, turn it into an compelling narrative, an interactive, there's interactive film. There's so many things that you can do to make the experience rich and that make people want to sit and engage with it. But, but again, you know, I, I'll say it again, you cannot just, it's not just business as usual in the virtual world. No, business is unusual at the moment. Yeah. I've got one more question. I'm going to fire to Claire, which is quite an interesting one. It's coming from Nick. Uh, adding an opt-out refund clause to convince clients to sign now for events in Q4. Good idea or not? Very much a commercial decision for the business and whether that's viable for your business. I've seen people do that. Um, and I guess the really big question is, will people sign up without that opt-out clause? You know, everybody's in the same boat at the moment of not knowing how, things, how long things are going to go on for. And so it may be that if you don't offer that opt-in clause, people won't sign up. So it's a real careful balancing exercise. Um, but I guess you need to be very careful that if you do put that opt-in clause, that you do, you're able to ring funds the money and you are able to repay it um, if the event was cancelled or postponed. Brilliant stuff. Uh, if we could maybe invite Marty, Jamie. One, sorry, if, on the uh, live thing, if I can sort of one last call for me on that, Please. is that standing still or ignoring what's happening, hiding in the corner is not an option. I think the, the, the virtual conferencing, streamlining and everything else is the solution for the time being. And if companies don't engage with that, don't do that, they will lose ground. You've got to engage with your people. You've got to engage with your customer base and you've got to find ways of doing that and doing it quickly um, because other people will be doing it and are doing it. And it's, it's really important to have, create these communities around your messaging. Couldn't agree more. Very good. Uh, okay. I'd like to offer my personal thanks to our panel, Richard, Karen, Christina and Claire guys, thank you so much. I'm now going to hand back over to James, who I'm sure will give us a good send off and give you details about the recording, how you can watch later and any information from this session that we can provide to you. James, thank you for having us. Thank you, Marty. Thanks, Marty. And thanks, everyone, for taking part in the discussion. Thank you for everyone who's been watching and uh, asking questions. If we didn't get around to your question, I'll follow up with the panel afterwards and Hopefully we can get an answer and we will post that when we post the video, which I'll do as soon as possible. Um, uh, so uh, in terms of posting the video, um, my editing skills are relatively limited. So bear with me, but I'll get out as soon as I can. Um, and we will send out some follow up materials that will, you, will hopefully benefit you. Um, Claire mentioned some, Karen mentioned some. So we'll get some, some follow up materials with you. Uh, um, as well when the video is posted. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, as um, we touched on moving events from live to the virtual space, and we will be running a full session on that and discussing how that might look, uh, hopefully with Karen as well, because she, she knows about this stuff. Um, we'll also be looking at suitable platforms for the various types of online type events that you want to run. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for joining us. We will get more information out to you soon, as soon as we can. And um, we'll be running a number of these sorts of events, discussions, groups, support networks. We've got a WhatsApp group. So there's lots going on from us and we'll just keep um, pushing it out to make sure you've got the support you need out there in the big bad world. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. everyone. Bye. Thanks. Virtual wave. <laughs>